Glory to Jesus Christ, Yoshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are in the book of Acts, chapter 1. As you already know, Jesus is taken up right before the eyes of the apostles. And after this happens, I would like for us to pay attention about what they did. And therefore, we go to Acts chapter 1, verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotus, and Judas, the brother of James. Verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. They all continued with one accord, that is, unanimously. And therefore, we see that the apostles, right before the birth of the church, we have to look to them to see what they were doing in terms of the communion and the fellowship that they were having. Unanimously, they were assembled together, and they continued in doing that. Today, there is no unanimity in the body. Even though Paul calls us to be of one mind, assembled in one body, around one gospel, there is no unanimity. And then we wonder, why is it that we do not see power in the church today? Well, it's because the church is disorganized and the body is out of order. People are playing roles that they are not supposed to be playing. Everybody wants another person's ministry. And so when we come together, there is dispute. Because different people have different understandings, and they clash, and we have debates. There is not one accord. There is not one mind. And everybody is trying to get their own glory inside the body by advertising themselves, rather than preaching Jesus Christ. Which, ironically is simple in that it is our only mission to preach Christ first and foremost, to be witnesses of Christ and preach the gospel. But perhaps it is too simple and we try to make it a complex process. And therefore we entangle ourselves in a lot of things. They came together, they continued with one accord, unanimously, in prayer, Prayer, worship also. So they came together with one accord unanimously in prayer, worshiping, and supplication, making petition with the women, with the women, and so the whole body was assembled, but in a context of fellowship. They were not assembled together to speak about random things. They came to pray together, to exhort one another, and make supplication, make petition before the Lord. And the whole church is present, men and women. Alleluia. And so this is what they were doing. This is what they were doing. And they were exhorting each other. And then Peter got up, verse 15, and in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, and then he spoke about the fact that Judas had taken his own life and needed to be replaced with a twelfth, so that they could be twelve apostles again. And it will come down to Barsabbas and Matthias 
and Matthias will be chosen. But the focus here is verse 14. These apostles, these disciples, they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. When the Lord tells us in Scripture, when we are gathered around his name, he is present, he's in the midst of us. It has to be that we're gathered around his name. We cannot be gathered around worldly things. It has to be about his name. It has to be about elevating him. And so the way to elevate him is to humble ourselves before him and make a request to him about the things that we need and are dealing with, making supplication in prayer and one with another with one accord. So this is one instance where we can see how they fellowshiped, how they came together, never forgetting that the Lord has to be at the center of this gathering. We will now go to the book of Acts still, but chapter 20. Book of Acts chapter 20. Let us go to verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And so he's going to abide, Paul, he's going to abide seven days in Troas. Verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to convene, when they came together, when they assembled to break bread, and they did so orderly, and not as was done in 1 Corinthians, where Paul is speaking a rebuke about the way that the believers would come together to eat this orderly. So now here, presumably, they're doing things correctly. They came together to break bread. And what do they do? Paul preached unto them. Paul was preaching unto them. He spoke of the things of the gospel, speaking of the things pertaining to Jesus Christ. And so Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. And so he had come to be there seven days. And it was the day before his departure. And yet he was preaching unto them. And he continued his speech until midnight. And so Paul spoke of a long time with them, preaching, even though they had had many days together to be one with another, on the day prior to his departure, Paul has not changed the topic of conversation, where it became a light topic to discuss the small things of life. He still was preaching about the core of his message and still preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, where you would think they would perhaps disengage from the gospel because it was the day before his departure and they would just have light conversations, we are told rather that he was still preaching the gospel the day before he would depart. And so they were taking this very seriously. There was no lapse in their focus concerning the things of the gospel. And further, we learn that Paul continued in the teaching to extend along, that is, prolong. When he continued, he persevered and stretched out his speech. And so we see the speech, logos, so that was basically what he expressed to them on a specific topic which pertained to Christ. And continued... So he extended, he stretched out, he prolonged his speech, his communication to them until midnight. Let's go to verse 8. 
and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together to convene, to come together. This is beautiful fellowship. Verse 9. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep, and as Paul was long preaching. We learned about Paul extending his speech, and it was preaching, not mundane subjects, and it was a long preaching. More in quantity, number, or quality, major portion. Preaching to say thoroughly, that is, discuss. So the young man was tired and fell into a deep sleep. Paul had been long preaching. What happened to the young man? He sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft, and he was taken up dead. Verse 10. And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him, said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. Verse 11. When he therefore was come up again, and had broken bread, and eaten, and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive, and were not a little comforted. So, brothers and sisters, when we look at our forefathers, when we look at the early church, we read these passages, but we have to pay attention. We realize that they come together in holy fellowship. We read that the topics of conversation are pertaining to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. And we see that this is done extensively, even for hours. And even when you would think that this is a moment where they may distance themselves from the gospel for a time, it seems that even though Paul had been with them many days, and even if it was the day prior to his departure, they still stayed focused about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this type of commitment this type of attitude whereby everything that they are doing is to the glory of the Lord, I believe is a great teaching for us to see these things and do the same. Paul said, follow me and do as I do in terms of being a follower of Christ, because we have them for an example. So I go now to the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Again, we see the same formula, unanimously assembled with one mind, with one accord, in one place. And so they come to fellow together, and they are of one mind. And then we know the story, the Holy Ghost will fall down upon them. But the point here is simply to again observe what they were doing. They fellowed together, and when they did that, they spoke of the gospel, and they did so extensively. This is something that we have lost nowadays. People even seem to have become averse concerning the word of God, and there is a pride there where people feel like, oh, I've already read that book. And they think that they know the book through and through because they've read it a few times, maybe. You're never done reading the Bible. I evangelize and meet people who tell me, I've read the Bible front to back. I've read it cover to cover. So don't really speak to me about the Bible. I know it all. But I ask them a simple question. Has it changed your life, though? And that's where they start peddling. Because now they realize that reading is one thing. But receiving the word and abiding in the word is a different thing. We're never done reading the Bible. If you read the Bible, certain things that you have already read and you read them again, the Lord will reveal to you other aspects of the word and build on what you know to take you even further in the understanding of the word. But there is a pride in the church right now where everybody is teaching the word, not necessarily having been established to do so. 
And therefore, because everybody's teaching, there are so many opinions. And now that sets up the table for a debate. Because you have those who have received enlightenment from the Lord to share certain things. And those who try to use their intellect to analyze the word, they also want to share their perspective. And the human intellect and God's intellect, which cannot be compared, well, they clash. And so one of the reasons why there is not harmony, one of the reasons why we are not in one accord, is because the spirit of dispute is come. The spirit of the disputer to ask questions about everything that is plainly laid out in the word. Or at least, if you have the Holy Spirit, you can plainly understand it. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, that we have the mind of Christ and that the things of the Spirit are spiritually discerned and we can discern and judge all things. And so with one accord in one place they were assembled. And this type of fellowship, which was regular, which was serious in terms of the content of assembling around the name of the Lord, that's what allowed the saints to walk in power. You see, that's what allowed the saints to walk in power. But today what happens is, saints do not abide at the feet of Christ. Saints do not abide in the word, and they don't feed the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in John chapter 4, that to do the will of the Father, that is his spiritual meat. He also says that the words in the Bible, they are spirit and they are life. And so we have to nourish ourselves with the word and be zealous of good works and doing the will of the Father. But today these values have disappeared. And this is why the church is not seeing the type of power that was operating through people in those days. Because people are not feeding the Holy Spirit with the word. And so we have weak Christians. And what do these weak Christians do in their pride and arrogance? They go as far as to say, let us bring up the concept of being a secessionist so that we can claim in our arrogance that the Holy Spirit doesn't work anymore. And therefore, we are not to blame for not manifesting any signs and power. But rather, it's because the Holy Spirit is responsible for this. Because it ha the Holy Spirit has ceased to operate. Let us build up a theory, secessionist. Instead of owning your condition and saying, well, we're not feeding the Spirit to where the Lord is using us to perform signs and wonders. And because it is so widespread that people are no longer being used for that, then they feel comforted by hearing that others aren't showing signs and wonders either. And then they accept that theory that they are not to blame, but rather God is wrong. God is in the lacking and they are okay. They are doing everything right. Instead of recognizing that they are lacking in the quality of the fellowship, the length of the fellowship, the quality of the content that is being discussed and being in the word, embedded in the word. This is where we draw our power to feed the spirit. And so this is where the church is coming up short. And on top of that, the arrogance is that we're blaming the spirit instead of recognizing our own shortcomings. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ was not slack concerning his spiritual life. And if we go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 35, we read the following. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And even when in the following verses, they tell him that everybody is looking for him. Everyone is looking for you, Jesus. Come with us. Let us go to these people. What does Jesus answer? Once they tell him that all men seek for thee, verse 38, 
And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And so Jesus was focused on being pleasant to the Father and accomplishing his ministry. Now you remember as well in Luke chapter 2, verse 41, Jesus was with his parents, and it was the Passover. And then when Jesus' parents left, he stayed behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. And what did Jesus say after that they found him? Verse 48 in Luke chapter 2. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And so men are seeking you to spend time in your presence. Men want to gather with you, but according to the projects that they have in the flesh. But Jesus knew that there was another type of fellowship that he was supposed to have, which he had to prioritize, and that was to be in fellowship with the Father. Verse 49, And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not, that I must be about my father's business. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. There are spiritual things that we have to come to understand and not remain carnal. We now turn to John chapter 4. You remember that as Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman, his disciples had gone away for a bit to purchase something to eat. And then they come back and they find him speaking to the Samaritan woman, and they expect Jesus to eat. Verse 32, But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Again, being carnal. There are people around you who are looking at you in a carnal way. They're not paying attention to your spiritual quest and the ministry that you have to fulfill concerning the Lord. Verse 34, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And so you see that Jesus was zealous about accomplishing the works that he had to walk into to please the Father. Indeed, in the book of Titus chapter 2, At verse 14, we read, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Because we are the Lord's workmanship, as we know from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Being saved by grace, not by works, but we are his workmanship that we may accomplish the works that he has prepared for us since past eternity. And so why do I make mention of this? Simply to show you this. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, we get to see the fruit of Jesus' consecration. Verse 22, Acts 2. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. He received the approval of God because he was pleasant to the Lord. Accredited. Someone that the Lord could look at 
to exhibit him and his behavior as a model to follow. Approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So the end result of this consecration by Jesus is that he is used by the Lord mightily, and he is confirmed by signs and wonders. A man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him. So it's God doing the signs, but he does it by him because he is a man approved of God among you. And so there is an approval that you can receive among other people because your consecration to the Lord is in good standing. And the Lord will use you and confirm you through signs and wonders. Now we go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. And so those who had spoken the gospel, after hearing it from the Lord, they also were confirmed by signs and wonders, diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, and this according to the will of the Lord, who similarly to Jesus approved of them among men and used these men according to his own will to perform miracles because they were pleasant in the eyes of the Lord. They had a pleasant testimony. They were consecrated and therefore they were vessels meet for the master's use. And so we connect this with what we were saying in the beginning. This crowd we're seeing here, these people who are being used mightily by the Lord, those are the same people or the same type of saints that were consecrated to the Lord. They were dedicated to the Lord, to the things of the Lord in the image of Jesus Christ. And therefore they were also confirmed with signs and wonders. And today, if we want to recapture this power that the church had in the beginning, we must show the same consecration. And so this is a call for us to start reuniting properly and to fellowship properly so that we are in good standing with the Lord and that we speak about things that pertain to the gospel and keep our eyes on the things of the gospel and do not allow ourselves to lapse. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And so our eyes should be on things that are spiritual, and we should no longer be lending our strength to the things of the earth. Of course, we follow earthly events, but when we come together to fellow, it should be about elevating the Lord Jesus Christ. It should be about his honor, his majesty, and giving him glory, whether it be as we saw in the book of Acts chapter 1, whether it be by praying, humbling ourselves before him and coming to him for strength, for him to help us in our situations, praying for one another, whether it be by worship, making supplication, and whether it be also by sharing testimonies of his power that we would have experienced because he has used us to demonstrate this power and we give glory back to him by saying, this is the testimony, this is what happened. And so God healed someone. God performed such and such a miracle and we praise him and worship him and elevate his name. 
this is the way in which they were assembling all the body with the women also in fellowship now. But today people assemble in friendship, which is a completely different thing. It's a worldly way of assembling. And the worldly way of assembling, we have the image of such a thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when the disciples come together to meet in a disorderly way. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. You see the spirit of dispute again? We were talking about being of one mind, of one spirit, one body, but there are dissensions. There are divisions. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And the analogy we can make is that when we come together disorderly, to speak about worldly things, instead of speaking about the gospel and preaching Christ, the way Paul would do at length when he met with the disciples. It means that we are not worshiping the Lord and paying attention to the proper topic and staying on course, preaching the gospel and discussing the things of the gospel, keeping our eyes on spiritual things. And so we come together, each of us having our own meal, each of us having our own concerns, and therefore we are not of one mind. We are not unanimous in what we come to do at the fellowship. And so we are back where we started, Acts chapter 1, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And so they got together, the believers, and they prayed together. They made supplication together, the whole body being present, the women also in the context of fellowshipping with one accord. And so they were of one mind, no dispute. And so they were having the same meal, the same bread they were eating. And that would be a spiritual image in comparison to what we observe in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where everybody seems to have their own meal, their own type of bread that they're eating. You remember in Isaiah chapter 4, starting at verse 1, And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us call it by thy name to take away our reproach. So this is the image of people who want to be called by the name of Christ. They want to be called saints so that their reproach be taken away by the sacrifice of Christ. But they want to have their own bread and their own apparel, their own food and their own dress, a mantle. They want their own spiritual clothing. They don't want to put on Christ. You remember how Elisha wanted to have the mantle of Elijah. He had aspirations to be, quote unquote, great in the faith. Well, the apparel that people want to put on today, it doesn't seem like they're searching for the mantle that is spiritual but they're looking for the mantle that is worldly. We have to put on Christ so that it is no longer us who are living, but Christ who is living in us. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20.
And then you remember we went to Acts chapter 20 to discuss how Paul went and preached to disciples. And even though he was ready to depart on the morrow, he continued his speech until midnight. And we're told that Paul, in book of Acts chapter 20, verse 9, Paul was long preaching. And so the topic of discussion was still the gospel. We have to do all to the glory of the Lord. And I think when the church realizes that Christ is our rock and that we must honor him constantly and everything that we do must be about him, then we will rekindle and connect again with him in a manner that will allow for us to be used to demonstrate power and be vessels meet for the master's use. So we have to put our pride and intellect to the side for a second and really dive into the word and let the Holy Spirit do the work. And so this is it, brothers and sisters. Just a message to remind us how the disciples, the early church, the apostles would gather and come together in holiness, praying and making supplication, worshiping the Lord, uh, all the body together, women and men, in the context of fellowship, I say, and not friendship. These things are the things we should look to for instruction and for edification so that we may exhort ourselves properly and be pleasant to the Lord, ultimately. So may you be blessed, brothers and sisters, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. And I hope that he continues to bless you and give you strength as you are walking for his glory so that you may finish the race and be crowned because you will have fought and competed lawfully. Be blessed. Alleluia. Amen.